they are saying because uh, they are the moralists within the military profession. For someone like myself, I would consider myself a moralist on the sideline. It is easy for me to say, I mean, the weapons and military are, 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 are brutal implements, they are inauspicious instruments. But for them, within the profession, they acknowledge the profession, there is uh, some kind of moral problematic in there. It is very, I think it's uh, 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 not easy to say this, and they are bold enough to say this. Okay, now let's go into the traditional uh, just war uh, discussion, the use ad bilum and use uh, in bello. Uh, you will see uh, Jim Johnson's name keep coming up because in my early essay, uh, I have an extended conversation with him and I learned from him a lot and we email and then we talk and then uh, that's why uh, it comes up in some, many, uh, some of the PowerPoints. Now, first of all, use ad bellum. I mean, they, this is a one clear uh, instance of uh, uh, use ad bellum. Uh, it is from this particular uh, treatise and then it says that, uh, let's ignore these parts and let's just go down here. And it says that for this reason, if one must kill a man to give stability and order the people, then killing is permissible. If one must attack a state out of love for the people, then attacking is permissible. If one must stop war with war, although it is war, it is permissible. So clearly they're talking about just causes here. And they ignore this one. And then there's another one, another one, another treatise. They're trying to separate their five kinds of army. And then in here, one of them is called the Righteous Army, and then the other is called by some, uh, some other names, which are, I mean, uh, sort of I mean, uh, unethical. But then for the Righteous Army, what, they do, they, what do they do? They suppress the violently perverse and rescue the people from chaos. And this is called righteousness. So again, this is some kind of, I mean, uh, just war thinking. And, uh, and use a balloon, yeah, just cause. Uh, so these are the commonly just causes talked about in these seven treatises. Uh, and then in Jim Johnson's work, he distinguished uh, the just resort to war and the wise resort to war, uh, saying that in the classic tradition, only the just resort to war is there. Uh, the wise resort came later. But in Chinese tradition that I just study, it seems to me that the, some of these wise resort to war uh, they, are, they were present at the same time as this just resort to war. So there's no such distinction between the wise and the just uh, in the Chinese view that I'm studying. And then, all right, now, then let's go to use in Balaam. There are three important passages. One is here, uh, in this particular passage, it says that when you go to war, uh, then wherever you go, I mean, do not cut down the trees, do not do this, do not do this, do not do this. Why? Because in so doing, then you will show the populace that you do not harbor vicious intentions. Now this is what I try to interpret is what I mean, Professor Walser said yesterday. You need to win the hearts and minds of the populace. And that's why I mean, you don't want to uh, hurt the civilians and the, uh, the non-combatants. And then in another passage, uh, it's again saying this, do not do this, do not do that and then uh, covering a large number of uh, different kinds of uh, civilians. Uh, and then there's also a third passage that I don't have time to quote, but there are three extended passages in these seven treatises that can belong to the use in Bello uh, uh, discussions. And these passages uh, acknowledge, say in this book, it produced in Taiwan, one civilian, one military man, and they consider these passages are equivalent to the uh, use in Bello. So I'm not the first one to talk about it. I'm not the weird one to put forward such a thesis. It is now gaining some kind of acceptance, uh, even say among the military in Taiwan. Uh, however, as I said, there's a monograph that study these seven treatises. It's still the only monograph. I mean, he's, study, he's teaching at Harvard. But then he has some very weird conclusion. Uh, he said, after studying these treatises, and then he said, when they talk about righteous war, and they said, the right, for them, the righteous war is the ends clearly justify the means. And then for them, and then he said that there's no a priori moral limits on the means and the methods of righteous war. I find it very astonishing. It's clearly there. And then for the three passages that I just quoted, then, but then Johnston was said, those are actually passages that apply to a post balum situation, which I'm totally perplexed. 
Uh, then the principal, well, how much time do I have? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, no, it's still nine minutes, right? Okay, I'll okay. okay. talk about, a little bit about proportionality. Uh, understandably, the principle of proportionality is not there. Even in the Western tradition, it came very late. So you wouldn't expect the Chinese to have this articulated at that time, uh, especially when the weapons are very primitive. But there is still, the spirit is there, this, namely the spirit about the concern about the casualties. Uh, the, concern, I mean, the concern of try to win the war uh, with as least destructive destruction as possible. So in that, that kind of moral sensitivity, I submit, is there. Uh, for example, you, in uh, this book, which is uh, extensively uh, studied in this country, The Art of War by, uh, by Sun Zi, or by Sun Su, uh, that's pronounced in this country. Uh, in this very famous passage in chapter three, he's talked about that the best way to do engage in war is to, I mean, you need to preserve rather than to destroy. Uh, and then, uh, and that's one very famous saying, saying that uh, subjugating the enemy's army without fighting, that would be uh, uh, the art of war par excellence. And then I, I skip this, and then continue on, he would say that, uh, how to do that, and then you first you need to attack their plans, and then attack the alliance. If all this would not work, then attack the army. Only if still would not work, then you are trying to attack the fortified cities, which would be very brutal. So I mean, for him, the priority is try to win the war with at least with uh, uh, the least casualty possible. And then this, uh, and then I mean, to finish the quotation again, he's saying that we must try to. I mean, the paramount the, param, the paramount aim is to fight with. I mean, to, uh, to fight at the same time to win and to also to preserve. Uh, so there's a very heightened sense concern for casualties here. And then this is not just me saying this. Uh, this is a very classic translation. Right now, there's something like 20 English translations of this treatise. I mean, that perplexed me. There's only some 7,000 words in Chinese, but there are so many English translations. And this is, I mean, from a very uh, reliable source and someone who has the military sensitivity. Uh, and then he, in his introduction, he said that for him, for Sun Tzu, I mean, to, in order to attain victory, you need to do A, B, and C, namely, you have to inflict on the enemy the fewest possible casualties. Uh, uh, that's why, I mean, this is interpretation by Griffith. So again, I mean, that there's a sense that there is a concern for casualty. And then you all know about this gentleman, uh, and actually I know about him from Jim Johnson, again, very indebted to Jim Johnson. Uh, but he also, he wrote a foreword to that English translation. And he said that, he said, I mean, in this passage, I mean, you, your eyes can read faster than my tongue to read it, so why don't you just read it? And then he continues on. He said that, uh, uh, he said that in reading Sun Tzu, he said there are many things I find him that uh, have similar, uh, I mean, similar thought with, my, with myself, especially on the, uh, what is called the indirect approach. And for him, the indirect approach it's good. Why did he say he, uh, the, the reason that he advocated the indirect approach for two reasons? Number one, he thinks there's a higher chance of success. And number two, because there would pro it would produce less casualties. And then uh, Eric Little says, I find the same thing in Sun Tzu. So again, I mean, the concern for casualty is there. Now, come to the PLA. There are, this is, you, I mean, these are, there are two books. You see the authors are in uniform, the PLA authors. And then for them, I mean, I can find that they also, they read more or less the same thing. Uh, in the interpretation of Sun Tzu, they said that in these passages, what Sun Tzu is trying to say is to make the enemy submit in the maximum degree with casualties to both sides reduced to the minimum. And then my view is, uh, the, in that kind of moral sensitivity is there, but it's present only partially or, and only as an ideal. Uh, but I don't see any reason why not it should not be I mean, turned into a requirement in the future development. All right, now in short, uh, let me skip this. Now, then let's come to the, the present. Uh, now in this, as I said before, these seven treatises in the past were, had the status of a canon. But now, it's no longer so because, I mean, things have changed. I mean, the government has changed. It's no longer monarchy and so on and so forth. 
And so in such a post-canon post age, uh, one is free to pick and choose and uh, select the parts of the canonical materials. And so these authority, they now have diminished. And also they have been fragmented because uh, in the past when they are part of the canon, you can harmonize them. But right now, and they, get, they all can stand alone and then there's diversity and tension uh, with them as, uh, as well. So instead of talking about one common tradition, you can now talk about different traditions. And then, now what I'm trying to say later on here in this part is the PLA has been very ambivalent on this idea of just war, and I try to explain why so. Uh, first of all, from the time of Mao Zedong, they say very clearly, I mean, they like the idea of just war, and then read this statement by Mao Zedong, history knows only two kinds of wars, just and unjust. I mean, he say, keeps saying it, this is 1935, 1936, 1938. I mean, he liked the idea of just war. And then this heritage lasts, I mean, even now and in uh, an encyclopedia volume of military science, 2007, there's an entry called just and unjust war. I mean, it said, puts in Chinese and in parentheses English, and English is just and unjust war. And so for them, the, the idiom is there. The PLA is fond of talking about just war. But for them, I mean, what are the examples of just war? I mean, they give these kind of examples, very, I mean, Marxist tainted. Uh, and then there, are, I mean, there's another one. I mean, these are all these uh, cliches. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, but then also in all these discussions, what is strange and what is amazing is they keep talking about just causes, but they, not, they didn't talk about what they used in battle. Uh, so I find this, uh, this is uh, uh, nooked worthy. Uh, and then perhaps I, let me skip this, skip this. I don't have time. Uh, uh, now, the Chinese, they, they, with that endorsement of the just war and also the just causes, and then also they have a statement early on that didn't go, I mean, uh, go into detail, but they are saying that in any future wars, China is going to engage why don't we read that? I mean, that's amazing here. It says, oh, this is by military, uh, very high-ranking military strategists, and saying that all wars that China might have to fight in the future will be forced upon her. Uh, these are examples. And such wars will be just and defensive wars and be fought with no other choice. And he's talking about all wars, all right? So there's, in that case, then in, the, then in any future, any wars, when you, uh, any wars that erupt, I mean, China would conceive, would perceive themselves fighting a just war. So in that case, the use in battle would be very important. Uh, otherwise, uh, 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 there's no way, uh, there, would be, there would not be any common language, common moral language that we can talk about uh, during the fight. Uh, but it seems, but then the PLA establishment has been silent on the use in battle. But only establishment. There are a few scholars that I'm trying to say, later on that uh, have that sensitivity. Uh, there's ambivalence, there are four uh, reasons to explain this. The first, fact, the first one is the fact of culture. Now, I have these two books with me, and I recommend you, I mean, the, any military institution in this country to buy and read these books. These two books are the only books available that will give you a glimpse into the military ethics of the PLA. It's published only a year ago. They are all expositions and comments on the different, I mean, uh, military ethics of different countries. And in this book, it covers not only the Western countries, not only USA, UK, Germany, and France, but also covers Israel, Japan, India, uh, Islam, and so on and so forth. Uh,